Hi everyone, welcome to the Marketing Analytics in a Week webinar, sponsored by Acton and presented by Stefan Sorger, the unofficial analytics ambassador. My name is Kristen Maida. I am a research analyst here at Demand Metric, and I will be your host. Any housekeep, uh, just a few housekeeping things. Um, anything, questions that you have, please, please feel free to add in the chat box or in the questions section. Um, any questions will be answered by Stefan towards the end of the session. So just to give you a quick agenda of what we'll be discussing today, um, we'll be discussing why Stefan has chosen a week for his marketing analytics um, training here. Um, also, we'll be discussing the daily tasks that go along with this week, and also the practices and pitfalls that come along with this. Towards the end of the session, we'll have about 10 minutes for a Q&A. And I'd also like to mention that we do have a hashtag for this, which you'll see at the top of the screen here. Please feel free to follow us uh, at Twitter, at, at demandmetric.com, or at ActOn Software. They'd love to discuss with you as well with this hashtag. Just to give you a little background about today's presenter, Stefan Sorger, as I mentioned, is the unofficial analytics ambassador. He has a wonderful background, including um, currently being the VP of Strategic Marketing for On Demand Advisors. He has authored a new book entitled Marketing Analytics, Strategic Models and Metrics, which he'll be basing his presentation off today. And he is also an educator. He's an adjunct faculty member at UC Berkeley. If you'd like to learn more about him or get in touch with him at all, his website is stefansorger.com. Also, to give you a little bit of information about our sponsor today, our sponsor is Acton. They are a leading provider of mark integrated marketing automation software. They have more than 1,700 companies using them to tie together their inbound, outbound, and nurturing programs. So if you'd like to visit them and learn more about Acton, you can find them at act-on.com. And with that, I will hand over the presentation to Stefan. He will be um, guiding you through the session today. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to chat message me or put them in the questions box. In, uh, personal academic research. It is a uh, luminous book with uh, almost uh, 500 pages of text and uh, 400 figures, tables and graphs, etc. It's very practical. You know, when I first started off, with this, all the books I found were really structured more around math, and this is the piece that I, I decided I'm going to create a, a book that's structured around marketing and products and things that people can relate with, and it's packed with examples, uh, both numerical examples and actual samples of companies doing the, the types of things I'm talking about. Uh, if you're interested, you can go on Amazon.com, you can search on the term marketing analytics, and it'll be the first one that comes up, or you can click on the link. I work for a company called On Demand Advisors. In there, we develop a concept called revenue engineering, which takes the regular marketing model to provide a much more predictable and and uh, authentic outcome of revenue. And we do that by defining the market through market surveys and other tools, by generating leads using the language we develop as part of those surveys, by nurturing and managing those leads, and by enabling the sales of uh, thanks to the foundation that we create for revenue engineering. We have many, many clients, uh, both small, medium, and large companies. And if you're interested, you can learn more about that with our free revenue uh, workshops held every month. Uh, the next one's on November 21st called How to Engineer Your Revenue for 2014. And if you're interested, you can go to onmanadvisors.com to register and see the complete schedule. So what are we talking about today? Uh, well, I'll do a brief introduction. I'll talk about why I decided on a week. And then we'll go into the different elements. Uh, so for example, on Monday, I'll be talking about defining the problem. On Tuesday, I'll be talking about selecting the people. On Wednesday, I'll be talking about preparing the technology. On Thursday, about executing the analysis. And on Friday, around gaining insight. And then I'll also share some practices and pitfalls along the way. So one of the reasons why we're looking at this is we see a lot of trends that are driving analytics adoption. Uh, one is certainly accountability. Uh, I know I'm certainly held accountable in my place of work to improve productivity and reduce costs. And that goes to the old adage, what gets measured, it's done. 
I also like it for data-driven presentations to, to back up the proposals and predict the success of plans. And I, like many, face massive data, terabytes and terabytes of data. What to do with all that data? One of the aspects about that data is that much of it is available online thanks to cloud-based data storage. So you get the speed and convenience, but you don't get the analysis. So that's what we'll be talking about today. Also, like me and our company, we have reduced resources, just like with other companies. Uh, the days of having many, many people in marketing departments, they're gone. We just have to do more with less. And more importantly, we have to show the outcomes of our efforts. And one of the things that does that is marketing analytics. Uh, it has many advantages. One is to drive revenue, and part of our goal is to reframe marketing from a cost center to a profit center. And the way we do that is we correlate spending and results. And one, one of the things we do there is uh, to save money. The old way where we basically execute the campaign and guess the outcome is no longer tolerated. The new way is to predict the outcome. And part of that prediction of outcome is to encourage experimentation, to test different scenarios. So what happens if we increase advertising 10%? And we decrease advertising 10%. We predict which will give us the best bang for our buck. At the end of the presentation, we'll be talking about how to persuade executives using that information. How do we talk about the revenue impact for marketing? And, uh, and, and to some degree, sidestep politics. Uh, we know that in many organizations, CEOs don't always appreciate marketing. Uh, some CEOs see it as really not as credible as some of the other areas, such as uh, finance. So one of the good things about marketing analytics is that it provides the metrics to give you equal footing, as such as some of the hard uh, tasks, such as uh, accounting and finance. But what is marketing analytics? And I think the analogy here of the elephant and the five blind men is apt. So I see a lot of misinformation about analytics. And for example, there's the guy on the ear of the elephant thinking it's a huge fan to, to fan people. And the, the gentleman says, it must be a, it's a fan. It must be social media. Then you see another gentleman uh, climbing a ladder uh, looking at the vast girth of the elephant and hitting his sides and saying, well, it's a wall. It must be big data. And you see the third gentleman hanging on to the tail of the elephant, saying, it surely must be a rope. So therefore, it's predictive analytics. The fourth guy says, uh, looks at the, uh, the large legs and says, well, it's a tree, so therefore it must be Google Analytics. And, and the fifth one says, it's a snake. It must be marketing automation. So they're all right. In, in essence, and that marketing analytics definitely encompasses all these things, but they're wrong as well because really it, it's better to see it as a framework. So this is a framework I use in my book and, and the framework that I like to use when discussing the topic. We start off with the foundation on the strategic side, chapters one through three. We talk about market sizing, segmentation, targeting, positioning. We move to chapter four, which is good time analysis. I see the next stage as strategy and operations, which is really around forecasting, big data, predictive analytics. Then we move on to more of the tactical side, which is the marketing mix. That's uh, product, price, place, and promotion. And we can use various tools such as Conjoin and Google Analytics and social media and so forth. And then we can move to sales and support, where we use uh, marketing automation. And then finally, on the tactical side, how do we operationalize analytics? And that deals with Chapter 12, which I call Analytics in Action. So why did I select a week? You know, and, and, and actually, I think it's, it's good to reflect on why I decided on this topic anyway. What I'm finding is that uh, two or three years ago, people were really struggling with analytics projects, really trying to see if this is the right thing for them. Uh, but a little after that, they found that, yes, it is a very cost-effective thing to do. It's a very uh, good thing to do. Uh, but the problem I'm finding lately is that people have the budget for these projects, but they just don't have the time. So the time is lacking. And I was, uh, I was laughing 
along with Kristen at the beginning of this call, saying, you know, literally in the in the 15 minutes that I'm I'm here waiting for the webinar to begin, I, I'm streaming in emails, emails after email after email, all representing projects. So I'm going to be busy until 10 o'clock tonight. I don't have the time to start on a new project, and I hear that over and over again. So why a week? It's really the project scope as compared to the appetite for quick results. So if I talk about a day, you know, marketing analytics and a day, that's just not credible for all but the most trivial projects. If I talk about a week, that's kind of a Goldilocks. It's a nice time. It's okay for small initiatives. It's easy to digest. And indeed, if you have a large project, I encourage you to break it up into small chunks so that each chunk can get done in a week. When we talk about months, that's good for medium initiatives, and it starts to get the perception of a major project. But when we get into years, then we really have to start managing risk because we might wind up with a runaway project. And here you can see the five building blocks. And needless to say, these building blocks are effective not just for thinking of marketing analytics as a week, but in terms of longer time spans as well. So uh, step one is defining the problem and building the business case. And we talk about doing that on this mythical Monday. Step two is selecting the people for the project. Step three is preparing the technology and data. Step four is executing analysis and computing the solution. And step five, gaining insight and presenting the results. And by doing it in this order and being very structured about it, I found very good results. The alternative is a mismanaged project, which I don't recommend. What I'll be using to demonstrate this process is an actual example that I led while I was a product manager at a Fortune 500 enterprise software firm. The problem that we had, and you can see it on the diagram at the bottom, we had difficulties assessing customer satisfaction of major companies or, or accounts. And we had headquarters, and you can see in the green, you can see the regional offices, and then the regional offices in turn dealt with the customers. Uh, I was in headquarters, so I did not have direct contact with the customers. And the problem was that the regional offices would give surveys to customers asking how satisfied they were. The customers would say they're extremely satisfied or very satisfied. And shortly thereafter, they would defect to a competitor. So that had to stop. So I, I couldn't trust this data anymore. One of the constraints we had is we really did not have additional budget for another customer satisfaction or customer sat survey. So the approach I wanted to take was, well, can I correlate customer satisfaction with, with other existing data? In other words, if I look at all the data at my disposal, uh, you know, operational data, financial data, technical data, I have, you know, terabytes of data. Can I look at that and see what other kind of metrics would correlate with high customer satisfaction? And of course, the times that we needed that as soon as possible. So we'll be using that as a, as a way to demonstrate how this process works. So on Monday, you wake up in the morning, you go to work, you find out you're the head of a new project. And uh, on that day, we'll be defining the problem and building the business case. So what does that look like? Two pieces, defining the problem, which is uh, has to be completed to estimate the project scope and building the business case, which is to estimate the cost savings or any other benefit you're getting from the, the, the project in order to justify budget for it. So what can I say about that? Well, from a best practices standpoint, you want to describe clearly the problem that you're going to be solving. So what I get a lot of when I say X, that's the wrong way. You know, I see problem definitions such as gauge customer satisfaction. That, that's much too vague to be useful. What's better, and I mark it as OK, is determine predictive indicators for defection. I think that's more accurate. The second topic is success criteria. So a lot of times, I don't see any success criteria. You know, we're done once the data is collected. Well, number one, you don't know, you know, when does that end, because we're continuing to collect data. And there's also no outcome. I don't know what I should be doing. So I say instead say something clear, like show a correlation at 95% confidence. So once we get that, we're done. The third topic is business case. 
to estimate the savings expected versus the cost. And the wrong way is we're going to improve customer satisfaction. I have no idea what that means. I mean, improve it 2%, 100%, what? Too big. Much better to estimate the hard costs and the soft costs and to say specifically how it is we're going to make money off of that analytics project. And in a few minutes, I'll talk about how to actually do that, how to actually estimate hard and soft costs using the example that we discussed. But first, we have a poll. In this poll, I'm going to ask you, how many of you have encountered the following problems? I've encountered project proposals without any clear problem definitions, project proposals without a success criteria, or project proposals without a dollar-based or zero-based business case. And I'm going to let uh, Kristen uh, uh, conduct the survey now. Kristen? Sure. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and launch this. I'll give everybody about 60 seconds to answer. Um, and you can feel free to answer as many as you like. Select all that apply to you. The poll is now open. So everybody go ahead and uh, take some time. I see we've got some responses already. So um, thank you. I appreciate that. Looks like we've got about half the people responded already, so thank you. All right, I'll just give everybody a few more seconds to answer. It uh, looks like we've got about 66% of the, the population here voted. So, um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. So just for everyone's information, 74% um, of the uh, group here has said that the first one applies to them, project proposals without clear problem definitions. 70% um, of the group has said that project proposals without success criteria applies to them. And also 70% of the group has said that project proposals without dollar-based business cases applies to them. Outstanding, Kristen. Thank you very much for that data. And, uh, you know, I would love to say that I'm surprised or even shocked by how high those numbers are, but I, ironically, I'm not. Um, I find this all too common. You know, I, again, I see analytics as a relatively nascent field, and one of the objectives of webinars such as this one, is exactly that, to, to provide some best practices. Because the problems with not doing these things are, are grave. I mean, you wind up with runaway projects, uh, projects that are over budget, and so forth. So I promised I would talk about the business case. And here it is. So here, for example, here's the example I used for the, the running example. And I like to break it up into hard savings, soft savings, and hard cost. Hard savings is anything that's completely measurable on dollar and cents basis. In this case, we are doing this project to prevent or to uh, substitute for a regional data collection process, uh, which at that time took uh, 20 regional managers about three hours each to do. And we had a loaded cost of uh, $100 per hour for a total of, of $6,000. Uh, the soft savings, uh, which is really around customer satisfaction, the computation would really be one lost customer. If you look at the lifetime value of the customer, it's around $100,000. The hard cost, in this case, would be me, a marketing analyst, uh, 40 hours, so a full week, at a loaded cost of $100 an hour, 4000 So the net savings is $2,000 of hard cost, plus any potential soft savings. And I like it as a best practice to only include the hard savings and to think of the soft savings as a bonus. Now we have Tuesday. We select the people for the project. So we have a core team and an extended team. The core team for a project of a significant scope typically includes a statistical modeler, a data analyst, and an analytics software developer. A statistical modeler is generally someone with a master's or a PhD in math or econ. And they'll be an expert at using SAS or SPSS or, or maybe R. 
data analyst is someone who uh, is skilled at working with large data sets uh, using SQL, SAS, and other tools. And the analytics software developer is someone who actually develops the code needed to uh, to run the, the project. And for, for larger teams, we will want an extended team, such as a, a project leader to lead the thing, a business analyst to, to see if the, the needs of the business are incorporated into the project, and an evaluator or tester just to, uh, to test it once it's done. And what I've done is I've collected some actual uh, job descriptions for each one of these, just to give you an idea, uh, an idea of the kind of people that people are looking at for uh, for projects like this. So uh, in this case, this is a uh, example of a statistical modeler. Uh, this job description I actually pulled from a company called SunTrust in Atlanta, and you can see that uh, this is someone with a PhD in uh, mathematics or statistics. Uh, they have skills in SAS or MATLAB. <clears throat> They've done quite a bit of quantitative modeling. Uh, they have a basic uh, understanding of financial statements, and they've been working with complex analyses. This is pretty typical of the kind of person that you'll find with a statistic model. Next, we come with a data analyst, and I pulled this one from an actual job description at Cisco and San Bruno. And here you can see they're They've been looking at a disciplined analysis of some kind, working with the, uh, the Cisco, Cisco teams, mainly working with big data tools such as uh, Hadoop and, and so forth, and uh, should have a, a knowledge of Unix, uh, Perl, Python, and large databases. Here's an example of an analytics software developer, pretty typical. This one's for Salesforce.com in San Francisco, and here, uh, they need to know automation frameworks such as uh, a Selenium and JA unit. Uh, if they've worked on BI tool testing experience, that's good. They should know HTML5, CSS3, and so forth. This is an example of a typical project leader. This one happens to be uh, at, at New York City at the Department of Information Technology and, and Telecom in Brooklyn. And here they're going to be managing the citywide performance reporting for Brooklyn. And they expect th these kind of people to have at least three years knowledge and experience of managing large projects, uh, skilled in WBS, which is work breakdown structure, knowing Microsoft Project, uh, and maybe even a, a PMP or professional um, uh, project manager certification. For example, the business analysts. Business analysts typically are involved in use cases, making sure that the uh, project meets the business requirements that are necessary for that for that uh, for that unit. Here's an example of a analytics software tester. Uh, in this case, it's a company called JMP, which is now a unit of SAS in uh, in Cary, North Carolina, and that's to validate statistical features and, and test it and look at different uh, test cases and make sure they work. So, how did this extend to my little week-long example, well, I did not have the benefit of such a uh, distinguished panel of experts. I had to do most of it alone, so it would mean that this statistical modeler uh, was not really necessary just because we didn't really have the kind of complex model uh, that we needed to justify a dedicated modeler. Uh, the data analysis was done by the product manager, me. The analytics software developer also was not necessary because of the simplicity of the model. Uh, the leadership was done by the product manager. I did reach out to our financial business analyst to get the data and to look at what different aspects he wanted to see in the model. Um, in terms of evaluation, uh, the testing was also done by me, the product manager. One of the things I would add to the list if I had to do it all over again, and one of the things that made this project successful was an executive sponsor. In this case, I worked uh, quite a bit with the vice president of products. Uh, he had, was very committed to the notion of analytics in terms of making a difference, and I found his help and guidance to be instrumental both in doing the project and also navigating the political uh, landscape. We moved to Wednesday, we, where we prepare the technology and data. And we have quite a bit of technology to look at. Here's just a partial list 
of all the many types of technology categories that are in there. So uh, we have on the left side the category, and on the right side just a handful of companies. Of course, these companies include many more than what's on this list. And you could also make the argument that you know different companies within this list could be applied to several categories. Nevertheless, these represent sort of the poster children, as it were, of these different categories. So affiliate marketing and link share, attribution analytics, or trying to figure out who gets the credit for the sale, like Visual IQ, big data analytics, such as Hadoop, customer acquisition analytics, such as Angos and Net Positive, data visualization, and now we're seeing the impact of your results, like uh, Tableau software, uh, direct or email marketing analytics, like Eye Contact, ETL or Extract Transferred Load, such as Informatica, marketing automation, such as Marketo Pardot and our sponsor, Acton, marketing intelligence and business intelligence tools, such as those from IBM, Marketing tools and templates, such as uh, our sponsor, Demand Metric. Predictive analytics, uh, such as the eponymously named Fair Isaac Corporation, also known to you looking for a home loan as the FICO score. Uh, social media analysis, as uh, Radiant 6. Statistical software, such as R, SAS, and SPSS. And web analytics, such as the uh, uh, ubiquitous uh, Google Analytics and Core Metrics. So how do we prepare data? Well, it's sort of a five-step process. I'm going to cover the first three here. We start by selecting, then we go to pre-processing, then we go to transformation. And selecting, we just select a portion of the data to target. For example, we might, to, we might want to just look at United States data. So we'll just pull out the United States data, and we'll just filter on that. We then move to pre-processing, where we cleanse the data. A lot of times we'll remove duplicate records. So we might have uh, Smith, comma, John, as well as John Smith and the records, and he might be the same person. But we need to remove one of those records, otherwise we'll have faulty results. As they say, garbage in, garbage out. If we fail to do that, uh, things will go wrong. Actually, if we transform it, and that can involve all sorts of different things. Sorting, pivoting, aggregation, merging, what I find the most is the situation of merging where we have multiple records and we need to pull them together. So now we go on to our second poll. How many of you encountered the following problems? Uh, number one, problems with selecting the right data to analyze. You know, a good symptom of this kind of problem is you do the whole thing and you've wound up filtering on the wrong data. The second one is problems with pre-processing the data where you, you, know, you wind up with errors because you forgot to dedupe it or wind up with multiple records or some such thing. And then problems with transforming the data. So that could be trying to merge multiple data sets or trying to find the one true data source for the document. And I'll turn it over to Kristen to have her conduct the poll. Thanks, Stefan. All right, I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll for everyone. Again, you can uh, select any that apply to you. And I'll give everyone, again, about 60 seconds to respond. Oh, wow, we've got close to 50% already. So thank you. Appreciate your responses. Please continue to vote. And again, select all that apply. All right, I'm going to give everybody about five more seconds to respond. Uh, we're close to 60% here of the group that's responded. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll now and share the results with everyone. So as you can see, we've got 65% that have responded to the first selection of problems with selecting the right data to analyze, 50% with problems with pre-processing the data, such as deduping. Um, we also have 60% um, with problems with transforming the data, such as merging. 
Thank you very much for those results, Kristen. And again, uh, again with high numbers. So, uh, again, it, I think it's a, a good symptom that you know marketing analytics has a ways to go, and that we'll we'll run into problems, and uh, it's something to, to remain vigilant uh, toward. When we look at the actual uh, running example that I had um, at the Fortune 500 company, for selection, in this case, I limited to the data to just the customers served by the regional centers. We did have a few other customers that were dealt with directly by headquarters. Those were definitely the exceptions. Uh, but to make the data valid, I did need to pull those out from the data set. From pre-processing the data, I did have removed duplicate records. When I look back, this was probably the longest time, most amount of work just doing this. I wish I could tell you there was a great tool out there that automatically and reliably dedupes. Um, there are services that do that, but I've yet to find a, uh, an adequate tool to do that. And then in transformation, I did have to actually merge two different databases uh, in order to make that, that happen. But that, that turned out to be relatively straightforward exercise. We move on now to Thursday, which is executing the analysis and computing the solution. We do that by going to the next two pieces of the uh, data flow diagram that you see on the bottom, which is number one, from a data mining perspective, to find patterns in the data, and number two, from an interpretation standpoint, to form judgments based on those patterns. Which of course is something we're always uh, we're always looking for. Uh, when so again, when we look at data mining and interpretation, uh, there's different ways to look at some of these patterns and find out is there something there I should look at. So for example, uh, let's say I I sorted the data and I wanted to find out you know who are the industries most interested in our products and services if I'm a if I'm a B two B player. Well, I would sort the data by, uh, by, by size of, uh, of revenue, and I would look at the industries that show up. I would find those patterns. Uh, I would see then that maybe the top five industries constitute the top 80% of sales. And my actionable information is that I need to really focus more on those top five industries then, since they represent a large amount. But there's different ways to go about it. Uh, there's uh, very complex statistical tools, um, and then there's simply uh, eyeballing it. Sometimes, you know, people just look over columns of numbers and identify patterns. I've certainly done that in some, in some jobs, uh, and sometimes that actually does work. Uh, you can sort it, like what I just talked about, where we sort the data um, by sales or another dependent variable and examine the trends, and then just analyze it. And there, we kind of roll up our sleeves. We get the, uh, the R or SAS or SPSS tool out, and uh, we perform regression analysis uh, or uh, uh, regression splines or other types of heavy-duty uh, data analysis. And I'd like to ask the uh, the studio audience here: what, 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 how do you generally analyze the data for patterns? What level of sophistication are you using? Uh, Kristen, take it away. All right, sounds great. I will start the poll here. Uh, with the last poll that we have of the day. And again, um, feel free to answer any and all that apply to you. And I'll give you about 60 seconds. Looks like we've got about 50% of the population answered. So thank you. We appreciate your responses. Please continue to vote. We've got about 30 more seconds here. All right, just a few more seconds. And I'm going to go ahead and close the polls. All right, so I'm going to close it down and share the results here for everyone. Uh, we've got 50% of the group saying that they um, eyeball for patterns, eyeball their, their columns to identify patterns. Um, we've got 88% of everyone saying that they sort their data. 
um, and examine trends, and 38% have said that they analyze it or do some type of regression or other types of analysis. That's great, Kristen. Thank you very much. And indeed, I see a lot of that in practice as well, where uh, you know, sorting, I would say, uh, takes the majority of time where sorting could be as simple as just sorting some columns of numbers and actually move on to you know, using pivot tables or other techniques to uh, examine trends without the time and, uh, what do you call that, I guess, sophistication commitment of a full uh, regression analysis. So let's say we've, uh, we've done data mining and we've looked at it, and then how does that play out in practice? Well, here's an example of, of what I did in the, in the project. Uh, for, the data, for the data mining, I actually ran regression analysis and I was testing different variables, uh, duration of their you know, time with us, the size of the company, the location of the company, the number of employees of the company, the annual sales of the company, uh, uh, the customer satisfaction scores, and then anything I could think of uh, to test the correlation of any variable with customer defection. Uh, ironically, what I found uh, in the interpretation side was that one of the worst variables to uh, to uh, detect customer defection was actually um, the customer satisfaction scores. Uh, customer satisfaction scores, I found, actually played a poor role in determining if customers were about to defect. And when I looked at all the data, the number one thing that suggests that people are about to leave your company is a financial term called DSO. DSO stands for Days Sales Outstanding. It's a nice way, uh, it's an accounting way of saying people are not paying their bills. Day sales outstanding refers to the number of days that uh, people have kind of left their invoices sitting on their desk and haven't paid their invoices. Uh, suffice to say, people who are not happy with you don't pay their bills. Some of you in small businesses know what I'm talking about, where a lot of times uh, unhappy customers don't pay their bills at all. They end up going to collection agencies and so forth. Uh, bigger companies also feel some of this, where they have to start aging some of the accounts receivable uh, and then start taking correspondingly uh, more drastic action as the uh, the day's sales outstanding moves from 30 days to 60 days to 90 days uh, and beyond. Uh, and again, we found a great correlation there, uh, uh, pretty much at the 95% confidence level that if someone hasn't paid their bill, in over 90 days, that should be a big, fat, red flag to you. Something has gone horribly, horribly wrong. So don't bother looking at their customer SAT scores. Just look at how quickly they pay their bills. If they pay their bills pretty quickly, even if they say they don't like you, they actually do like you. They're not ready to defect. They might grow a little bit, and you definitely want to take uh, you know, action on that. But they're still with you. But once they stop paying their bills or they're late in paying their bills, uh, that's the time that action is required. You need to step in and do something about that. And that's what I talk about when I talk about actionable information. Not general information that's interesting, but things you can use to actually uh, create and, uh, excuse me, generate and save revenue. So now on Friday, uh, we have to gain insight and present the results. Now, this seems pretty straightforward. This seems like, well, this would be a no-brainer. I mean, we have such a, a great result. Why would we not want to share that? And what could possibly go wrong? Well, this is what could possibly go wrong. This is an actual slide that I doctored only a tiny bit. This is from a, uh, an operation interview that I had with a uh, major company, not the same one that we talked about just now, but a different one, and not that operations review. The heads of various departments go before the, uh, the general manager of that division, the multi-million dollar division, and you know, state what's going on in their department and state if they need additional resources such as headcount. And at that meeting, we had two people show up, or two people of the many show up in these two slides. The first one is the head of engineering. And the engineering department was a large department, about 100 people strong and really formed the basis of most of the revenue of the company because of all the products that it, uh, it developed. 
But when we look at the slide, it suggests differently. So for one thing, it kind of goes on and on and on and on and on. Uh, when I look at this even now, even though I've looked at this a long time, I, I have I struggle understanding what it is this person is actually talking about. There seems to be some kind of need for additional resources at this company, but I don't see any correlation with what this department does and any kind of revenue. I don't see any correlation with if I don't hire these people, what will happen? I don't see any correlation as if I do hire them, what will happen? And I really don't see any need to really, you know, get more people in here. In fact, it's, it's a very, it's a very bad uh, example of how to communicate with analytics. You can see this person has introduced some numbers, but that's not what we mean by analytics. By analytics, we mean actionable insight. And we look at this slide, I don't see any actionable insight. Compare that then with the next person who showed up, which was the head of a much smaller department. In this case, the professional services organization would implement the products that engineering would develop. So it's a much smaller department. But here you can see they've taken the trouble to correlate what they do with the revenue recognized by the company. And here you can see these orange dots as actual revenue earned to date. They've managed to correlate that. You can see on the left with the number of resources so that as you know, the, the number of projects go up, the number of resources has to, has to go up correspondingly until they hit a current resource level with that dashed horizontal line. And what they're saying at that big green arrow is at that point we won't have enough resources to take on additional projects. And that will then stop the incremental revenue. So this is a much more actionable insight. This tells us not just that we, we need some people. I mean, everyone needs people. But what's going to happen if we don't? And what's going to happen if we do? This is very, very powerful. And I was present at this operations review uh, representing marketing. And here, you, and here I could see the difference in the outcome between the engineering approach and the professional services approach. And needless to say, the engineering department did not get their wish. They did not get any additional people. But the professional services team did. They were able to apply analytics in such a way that their insight was rewarded. Now let's see what happened when I did it for my project. So for my project, when I uh, presented the results to senior management, the conclusion obviously was great. I mean, the problem was solved. We found the correlated variable. I mean, that's all fine. Ironically, though, what I thought would be the primary outcome which, of course, was the money savings and the increased accuracy we were looking at, turned out to be the secondary outcome. I mean, it's fine, and I got a pat on the back for the money savings, but mainly people were enthralled about the fact that you had one metric, ESO, that you could examine to predict defection in major customers. This was a big deal in the enterprise software world, and people recognized that to the extent that we decided to ghostwrite an article, which was quote unquote authored by the executive vice president, but in fact written by me, that talked about how we came up with this information, what it means to you, how you can apply it, you know, what what are some good best practices to use in a data scenario and so forth. And it really positioned the company as an expert in analytics. Uh, and because we did so much work with the enterprise software space and the analytics front, that gave us a lot of credibility when we spoke with, uh, with customers. That was a pivotal event in the, uh, the history of the company. So that, that, in fact, was the primary outcome. So what can we then say are some of the key takeaways? Well, on Monday, that's with the problem definition, you know, stating clear definition success criteria in business cases, and indeed 70% plus of you stated that that those are issues there, that people right now are not defining the problem correctly, are not uh, looking at success criteria, and are not developing dollar-based business cases. On Tuesday, identifying the right people for the job and making sure you have those kind of stuff around uh, when times come. 
on Wednesday then to prepare high quality uh, data, you know, and like the old adage says, uh, garbage in, garbage out. If you wind, if you start with a poor quality data set, uh, you'll wind up with junk as the, uh, the output anyway. And you know, again, as the poll said, over 50% of you said, you know, there are issues in pre-processing and transforming. On Thursday, then, be on the lookout for patterns in data. I never thought, I never thought, not in a million years, that I think that DSO, something as boring as an accounting variable, and I say that in jest, would be the crux of such a significant analytics discovery. And yet, I was open to that, and I found that to be the case. And then on Friday, to develop presentations that scream action and insight, to really show just how significant the output of the presentation uh, really is. And uh, at this point, I'd like to open it up for, uh, for questions. Uh, Stefan, I've got a first question here from our questions box. Um, it is, why would you assume that customers not paying bills didn't have more to do with primary client having left the company or those companies' business failing rather than something that your client must correct on their side? So, I mean, yeah, so once in a while, a, you know, a company will go bankrupt or they will go uh, out of business or something. But I would, I would say that's the, the exception rather than the rule. Uh, I think here, I think the lesson learned for me was that if you do see the, uh, the DSO really start to ratchet up or you see it into kind of the red zone, uh, to find out what's going wrong. So it could be that it's an accounting error. It could be that they, in fact, really don't like what you're doing. But in all cases, this is something that needs to be investigated. And the fact that the company is going out of business uh, or, you know, can't pay its bills, that's also of deep concern to, uh, to the company as well because, you know, we need to talk about that. Because otherwise, you're just going to blithely assume that everything's fine. Great. Um, I'm not sure if this is a question um, from Rachel. Uh, I'm dealing with cultural differences and perhaps educational atmosphere that there's confusion with marketing. She's German-based. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a question there or um, if she was just commenting on the last. Did you have anything to say about that, Stefan? Sure. So you know, I don't. I can't say I'm an expert in, in uh, cultural differences and, and uh, you know diversity and of, uh, of workforces, but I can say one of the advantages with uh, analytics is that I find that metrics and models kind of cut through the clutter. You know, there's a lot of noise, uh, a lot of big powerpoints that marketing delivers, many of which aren't read. There might be uh, you know, if there's people working in a, in a multinational company people that really aren't native speakers, that are, find themselves difficulty being uh, communicating. One of the great things about analytics is that it applies to the universal language of mathematics, and that's uh, something everyone can understand. Great. Um, I, I'll, I'll mention to everyone, feel free to put your questions in the questions box or send us a chat message. Be happy to answer. I think we have some time for a few more questions. Uh, before we, we cut out for the, the afternoon. Looks like we've got one here. Okay, so some companies and clients do not um, use analytics, so they need a structured approach at a less in-depth level. I've already got the book. Um, helpful webinar, and we'll revisit the book. Um, that was a comment back from Adrian Hargreaves, I believe. And I've got a question here from Seth. Um, in your opinion, is a tool like Tableau necessary? Oh, I don't know if, if anything's necessary. It's just helpful. So there's, there's different kinds of people out there. So some people can just stare at, at columns of numbers and see instantly the patterns. Um, I am actually blessed that way. I can actually look at columns and numbers and see patterns instantly. But most people aren't. So for them, uh, I think a data visualization tool like Tableau uh, will help. It, it will basically mechanize a lot of what you could do on your own with Excel, such as putting together charts and graphs and so forth. 
Um, it won't do anything additional to the data, but just helps you visualize the patterns that are there. All right. Thanks for that, Stefan. Um, do we have any final questions um, for Stefan before we finish up the session? We have time for one or two more. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and I will say that in addition to the questions, you know, here that if uh, if some of these questions are answered, or you know, you might be having microphone difficulties, whatever, um, you'll see the link on your screen to madmetric.com slash form slash all slash grid. That's a uh, a Q and A community within demandmetric.com. It's a forum. And what's nice about the forum is there's a lot of people like, like me and, 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 and Jesse Hopps and Jerry Rackley and other people that are highly skilled in analytics that discuss questions like these and um, provide best practices and so forth. And there's a thriving community on that website. And I definitely encourage you to go visit there. You know, in case, you know, in the middle of the night, tomorrow night, you think of the question, you can just, uh, and you couldn't think of it now, just go to that forum and, and ask it there. So, you know, we see this as the beginning of the conversation, not the end. Um, so, Stefan, it looks like we've got one last question, actually, from Jerry Rackley, Chief Analyst here at Demand Metric. Um, it says, what do you do if people don't believe the data that is coming from an analytics initiative? So what I like to do, and, and that's a great question, Jerry, and, and thanks for you know giving me a hardball question at the end of the uh, presentation. But the good thing there to do is to really look at best practices, to, to go and actually detail how you got the data. What I see a lot of times by some uh, analytics amateurs is they just sort of present the data as is without any real structure, without any real process, without any real best practices. And the problem is when you do that, you kind of, you, you give the opportunity that the data might be tainted. You give the opportunity that, you know, not so much that the data is falsified, but that you didn't really use some of the best practices. And by emphasizing, you know, how we use, you know, high quality data, you use a good framework like we talked about in this uh, webinar and so forth, you can start to develop credibility. And for me, that's the number one issue with marketing right now, is that a lot of CEOs don't find CMOs credible. But by, by really making sure you have high quality data, making sure you present your information in an impactful way, like we covered here, you can start to turn that ship around to where the CEO will see you as not a cost center, but as a revenue center and your credibility uh, will skyrocket. Great. Um, I think we've got uh, two more questions here. I think we have time for one more. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and use Seth's question, and then I'm going to um, suggest to Derek to go to the community, as uh, Stefan suggested, and, and get some responses there. Um, so Seth's question is, is it wise to build a data warehouse to conduct thorough analysis? Absolutely, yeah. So when you look at that, uh, when you look at that data diagram that I showed earlier, um, that cylinder, uh, it, it, it kind of represents a data warehouse. And what you'll find is that uh, it's not so much that you can't do it with a regular data set. It's just that a data warehouse, uh, it, it suggests, number one, that you're using the right tool for the right job. And number two, it implies a certain discipline around the um, the data integrity, and to Jerry's point, and to Seth's point, uh, that data integrity and that data quality is essential if you are be, to be uh, believed as credible within your organization. Great. Um, so um, as I mentioned, we've gotten a couple more questions here. Um, I'm just going to suggest to these two um, attendees to go ahead and um, put your questions in our um, in our community. If you prefer to remain anonymous, you can feel free to email me. Um, I'm going to chat message everyone my email address, also Jerry Rackley, our chief analyst email address. So if you prefer to keep your questions confidential, feel free to email us. Um, so thank you, and um, we're going to end the Q&A session. So um, Stefan, please feel free to, to continue. <laughs> 
Uh, so uh, let's move on here to the next slide. So do you want to talk about this, uh, Kristen? Sure. Um, so again, um, our sponsor, ActOn, has been um, gracious enough to to sponsor this webinar and to have Stefan come on and give this great presentation. Like I mentioned, they are an integrated marketing automation software, and they've got over 1,700 companies um, providing uh, marketing automation and tying all of their inbound, outbound, and nurturing programs together. So you can visit them at act-on.com. And just a little information, background about us, Demand Metric, the host. Um, we're in a marketing advisory firm. We're serving over 3,000 marketing professionals and consultants around the world in 75 countries. Um, we've got consulting methodologies, advisory services, and a library of 500 plus tools. We work to make your lives more efficient and more effective. So feel free to check us out at demandmetric.com. And if you, again, if you have any questions about us, uh, please feel free to send an email to me or Jerry. I'm going to chat message everyone now with that information. I believe that's the end. I believe that is Thank it. Thank you very much. So uh, let's Thank just... you very much for having me here. Thank you so much, Stefan. We appreciate your time and um, the great presentation. And I want to thank all of our attendees today for coming and, and listening and joining us. Have a great rest of your afternoon.